So thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm from Intel. Um, I'm representing here today the team's work. So actually most of the team is working in Europe and they could not fly over and I'm based in Santa Clara. So that's why I'm giving the talk today. So what are actually we are trying to do? So we are really obsessed with performance in our team at Intel and uh, our goal is, and I think that is also very nicely aligns uh, with the goal of your entire OpenXLA project to give you Ninja performance on our hardware, okay? And we do a very interesting job when you look into our, our manuals, every year you get a new ISA extension, okay? And then you get a new feature there, so it makes it very, very hard to actually get performance. You use our libraries, but if you have a changing model, so to speak, it becomes very hard to keep up with all of the stuff. So what we're trying to do in Interlabs is a research to say, okay, can we actually do better than that? Can we actually compile topologies down? And I'm showing you today a little bit how we are doing this and how we're leveraging MLIR for that and in future actually trying to use OpenXLA for that. But again, why is it so hard is we have to vectorize by hand. We have to think about how to lay out the data. We have to deal with caches they normally get into a way on a CPU especially. And then all of this is actually intermingled and entangled. You make a decision here, then it might invalidate a decision you made somewhere else. And that's why there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. So what did we do over the last couple of years actually? So we started completely without compilers and writing template libraries. And what I'm showing here on the right, this is our research software stack, what we are using in its inside into labs. So we're abstracting right away all our hardware away in, some, away in something we call tensor processing primitives. And if you think about that, it's actually a software defined virtual ISA of 2D tiles, which supports sparsity broadcasting operators. So if you think about MATLAB or NumPy semantics on smaller blocks, that's actually what it is. And for the compiler, it becomes a scalar. If, if you want to think about that. It's just a scalar. We are uh, writing our transformations on top. And we implemented multiple things, which we use an archive paper on libraries, graph APIs, or even complete, uh, complete framework extensions. And the goal is now, can we actually do that completely automatically in our research? And what are we doing? We're taking actually Linux right now as an input ingress front end into our compiler. And then we're trying to come up with new layouts which are optimized for the target hardware. How do we parallelize now on these layouts? How we do fusions? If you think about an MLP, we have an activation function and the bias edition. We don't want to write to memory, we want to fuse in registers, etc. And all of that is right now happening. I put here the repositories we are using for that. So it's also a, today, I think we are showing multiple repositories where we're working on because it shows us in very active development field. And the most important thing, it's not a product, so we do that completely in the open. So everything here is in the open, so you can yell at us that this is all crazy or basically love it. Um, therefore, how does the bird's eye view actually work before I go into the performance and tell you some very, very early results we are getting in that. So as I said, we're starting on Linux on tensors. So this is all before barbarization. And here we want to take big, decisions, so to speak, which hopefully are no longer entangled than what we do later on, but we use information from the lower level stacks. And that is fusion, blocking, and actually how do we select the operations of that virtual ISA we are defining, right? We really want to abstract all the machines away into that virtual ISA, and we also make parallelization decisions on this level. Okay, the next one is then we transferred it in our virtual ISA. It's still basically in SSA form. And here, right, we do then reorders of fusions of these virtual ISA things. I haven't talked about that much, but the virtual ISA is defined memory to memory. So we now need to fuse in a logical way an SSA value so that we actually can talk about register allocation later. And that is then actually happening in a, uh, in a bufferization step and cleanup. And in the end, we can then lower to the real kernel hardware, uh, to the real kernels. And what we lower today, we have actually three ways how we can execute now. We can either say we lower that to loops and SEF and let LLVM handle that stuff, or we lower to our microkernel library, which we call libxsmm. And this is heavily optimized for various CPU platforms out there. So for instance, just you have now two results, uh, two slides with results. So this here are important gem shapes. Uh, I took a recent block, uh, which potentially many of you know uh, uh, from modular. 
and because I like this block and it gives a nice summary actually this gem shapes are good and that's why it's good for us because we can just show what we can do here and you see one DNN is the golden standard that's our production software so can we actually meet that and you can see with this dark uh, uh, green bars that is our compiler as it works today it's it's behind but it's actually in pretty good shape and if we do an offline tuning, so basically having better performance model with that entanglement better resolved, you can see more or less get the solid performance as you actually have it on uh, one uh, DNN. I talked about fusion and different hardware, and that is basically our uh, MLP here. I'm showing an MLP with BIOS fusion and Relu on different hardware. So you see it's AMD hardware, it's Intel hardware with accelerators, with Graviton 3, actually completely different ISAs, all going through the virtual ISA with a specific lowering and getting close to FMA peak. And you also see adding actually an MLP versus a chain gem is actually not giving any performance difference. Somehow that's got lost here uh, when converting the PowerPoint. So I skipped this slide. So what is the end-to-end -end integration actually? So we don't want to invent a new compiler, okay? We want to have actually just a set of passes or transforms where you can have for a hardware to be lowered to. And uh, we have it running in Erie right now. We can run BERT, for instance, completely to completion with that, but performance is still a different story. That's why I didn't show it today. But I think going forward, at least our plan as researchers is not really to develop our in-house solution, but upstream as much as possible, potentially even get a better way from the community how this virtualizer could be defined as a universal microdialect. And also right now we're adding a GPU support for that. So with that, I think I made it through in something like nine minutes, hopefully. Excellent. Right on time, we can simultaneously Applaud your presentation and also welcome PyTorch 2.0 and Torch XLA with Will and Shaheen. Is this the mic? Okay. Hello, I'm Will uh, and I work on the PyTorch team at Meta. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I can raise this up for you. Thanks. So I'm here to talk about PyTorch 2 and Torch XLA. And I've actually been working closely with the Torch XLA team at Google for the last couple of years on uh, bringing uh, some of Torch, Torch XLA's lazy tensor tracing into PyTorch. And uh, I also work on the PyTorch 2 team. So PyTorch 2 is a new feature that was announced uh, at the PyTorch DevCon last December and finally released this March. And the main idea with it is a new compile API where you can just wrap a model in torch.compile and you can get a big performance improvement. And so the things that went into this, there's, there's a lot of, uh, actually there's two main things that went into making this possible. One is a new way to capture a graph uh, from PyTorch and the other is a backend that can actually do something with the graph and make it faster. And so, yeah, I'm also representing a, a big team effort here. A lot of these ideas came from Jason Ansel and his initial research into Torch Dynamo and Torch Inductor, but also quite a lot of, uh, of work was done by the great PyTorch team. So thanks to the whole team. So graph capture from PyTorch is a, a really big challenge, a bigger challenge than, uh, than in a framework like TensorFlow because PyTorch is so unstructured. People put all kinds of crazy things into PyTorch programs like calls into NumPy or calls into C++ or any, any random thing. They use a lot of Python metaprogramming. And we don't want to change that. We don't want to make people rewrite their models in a way that conforms to some kind of a spec because we want to be flexible. But that makes it really hard to do a compiler for PyTorch. And so there have been a few previous attempts to make this possible, uh, including TorchScript where we would actually do semantic analysis and try to build up a representation of the Python. And have, that made us under, have to understand every, every little feature in Python. And typically what would happen is people would get errors, their models wouldn't be compilable. They would have to file a bug, ask for some more, some more features. Then we introduced TorchScript git tracing, which would trace pretty much all the time just by recording a sequence of operations, but they wouldn't be safe to use. And then a lazy tensor, which actually was developed here at uh, Google, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, um, actually records a trace 
and computes a hash so that it's safe to use. And then uh, FX, which actually captures a, a graph of operations in a tracing style too, but again, doesn't have safety. So all these attempts were to solve this problem of how to capture a PyTorch program. And they all came with different trade-offs and uh, difficulties. So Dynamo is the latest uh, addition to this, this group of, of front ends, and it combines uh, a low latency. Um, it, it, makes, it makes it possible to capture and execute a trace by interposing at Python at the top of the call stack and removing the latency that's associated with tracing, for example, in lazy tensor, but also providing safety guarantees. So we can be sure that the trace you're about to execute is actually safe, and if not, we'll recompile. And the final tenet of it is providing a good user experience by actually falling back to eager uh, if, if something can't be compiled. The other main piece of PyTorch 2 is the compiling backend called Torch Inductor, which is a backend that uses its own IR um, and generates and finds uh, regions that can be fused and then targets either a C++ code generator for a CPU or a Triton-based backend for GPU generating a, a Python runnable that represents the program and includes calls into these fused Triton kernels or CPU kernels, as well as just calls into eager PyTorch operations or um, collectives, things like that. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about PyTorch XLA. I wasn't here when PyTorch XLA started. I think it started in 2018 with the main goal of uh, bringing PyTorch to the different types of accelerators powered by XLA, so namely TPU, but then also GPU and others as XLA is growing. And so PyTorch, PyTorch XLA developed this new lazy tensor tracing system. And it became generally available on, for TPUs in 2020. And a little bit after that time, I started working closely with the Google team here, um, Jack and Malad and others and Shaheen to upstream the lazy tensor tracing system into PyTorch so that we could maintain it and make it a little bit more closely integrated with the PyTorch uh, code gen for our, our operator library. And when we did that, we got a system that was pretty maintainable and provided a good way to acquire PyTorch graphs in a flexible way. It can still fall back to eager um, when something's not traceable, and it can trace most programs and capture full graphs. But there's still a problem of the latency involved in doing lazy tracing, because every time you do a lazy trace, you have to perform the full trace before you can compute a hash and decide if you have a cache hit and you can use a compiled binary. And so the, the main, uh, I guess the target workload for, for lazy tensors originally was training. And in a lot of cases for training, you can actually overlap this tracing cost with execution cost or execution time. But in some models, there's a lot of uh, CPU side overhead, even in training. And then on inference, there's also a lot of overhead. You can't hide behind anything if you want to do a short latency inference and you just want to get a result back. So to overcome both of these limitations of lazy tracing, we wanted to combine PyTorch 2's Torch Dynamo front end with the lazy tracing system. And so Shunting, who's sitting here, actually, you can, you can ask him questions later if you want to wave. Um, it'll be in the PyTorch session in the afternoon developed a backend for, for Torch Dynamo that actually takes the graph, the FX graph produced by um, Torch Dynamo, produces the forward and backward graph from it, and then runs that through lazy tracing to lower to XLA. And so this has the advantage that it, it basically works with all of the features of Torch XLA, but it also removes all the latency of tracing after the first time. So PyTorch XLA, is a system that produces stable HLO, or, or it will produce stable HLO. Um, it's adopting PJRT as the runtime, and it has a C API that can target multiple hardware. I think I saw a PR that uh, Intel has just added a, a, C, a C API plugin in open source for, uh, for the XPU device. So there's some growth there. And um, it's exciting to bring these these two things together with PyTorch 2 and Torch XLA. So now I wanted to hand off to Shaheen to talk a little bit about the performance of Torch XLA and PyTorch 2. Thank you, Bill. So um, some of the results that I show here is a direct result of the uh, development that Will just mentioned to basically include Dynamo into PyTorch XLA 2.0. 
This one is on GPU inference. The initial numbers that we had across multiple different types of models shows that we are having a good gain over the geomean for all of the uh, improvements is about 1.5. So uh, Dynamo is here actually helping on GPU inference. So this was one of the uh, top things that we were uh, excited about. On TPU as well, inference is uh, well improved using Dynamo. So uh, you can see across, again, multiple different kinds of models. We basically use uh, TorchBench and a few other uh, representative models to basically test and make sure that the performance using uh, this new path of uh, using Dynamo and PGRT is actually improved uh, over uh, the lazy tensor uh, graph capture. And then finally, this is uh, some inference numbers for uh, LAMA. Um, LAMA is this large language model from AI. We have basically tried to go across multiple different parameter sizes from 7 billion to 175 billion parameters and um, do inference on various different uh, topologies of uh, TPUs. And uh, you can see that, for example, at 65 billion with a V4, uh, 64, we reach a 12.47 uh, millisecond uh, latency for the model. Um, you want to talk about the current projects? Yeah, so we're still working on some extensions to Torch XLA and Dynamo. Um, one of the things we want to do is enable CPU fallback. So right now, it's not that easy to have Torch XLA tell Torch Dynamo which ops in particular which ops with which data types and sizes uh, to fall back to eager for um, before getting to the stage of lowering to XLA. So we're working on a way to do that. And um, I'm also working on a, a way to capture a full train step. So right now Torch Dynamo captures the models forward and then runs it through AOT Autograd, which generates a forward and backward trace. But you get separate graphs for forward and backwards, which get compiled separately by the back end. And XLA really likes to get a full graph, uh, including the optimizer. So we want to be able to provide that. And uh, I have a prototype in progress for that. There's also a large effort to do dynamic shape support, uh, where basically PyTorch has a new feature based on these things called simments that let us trace, um, that let us trace uh, operations with sort of a symbolic notation expressing that instead of a literal integer that says like the size of this input is four, it's the size of this input is like S zero, which came from some other input. It lets us build traces that we can reuse and transform, preserving some sort of dynamism. And we're working together with Torch XLA to, uh, to work with XLA's dynamism. As well as distributed, uh, there's ongoing work to extend what's being done with uh, FSDP and um, SPMD from PyTorch to Torch XLA. And so, yeah, I think to close out, I think we want, we want to add support for custom ops, um, uh, exploring becoming an optional dependency for PyTorch and getting, getting more and more out of Dynamo. So thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Right on time. Next, we have high dimensional layout representations for vector distribution. Round of applause. All right. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Harsh Menon, CTO at Not AI, and I'll be talking to you about high dimensional layout representations for vector distribution with an application to flash attention. It's quite a mouthful. So as you all know, matrix multiplication is the core unit of computation uh, for neural networks. As a result of that, all ML AI hardware has specialized units for doing matrix multiplication, such as tensor cores on NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, but each one of these specialized accelerators has very specific requirements on what the data layout needs to look like. So here, for example, uh, what I'm showing you here is a 16 by 16 matrix, and this is the data layout requirements for the MMA sync operation for the NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, what you can see is each one of the elements of this matrix has been annotated with a number, which indicates which thread owns that particular piece of data. 
So since the majority of the compute kind of centers around matrix multiplication, this layout is very important, but it's also important because matrix multiplication is going to be surrounded by several other operators. And so we would like to reuse this layout for all the other operators that are around it so that we can avoid the cost of data movement from registers to shared memory and back. And so for these reasons, it's important to consider what should the layout be represented as? How can we take this complex layout here and how should we represent it? And to that end, I propose a higher dimensional representation. And what exactly is this higher dimensional representation? Well, I think it's a little bit more obvious when you look at an example. So let's look at this uh, 16 by 16 A matrix that I just showed you. And if you look at the, let's just go along a single row here. If you look at the first two elements, you see that they are basically elements of the same vector that are owned by thread zero. And so we can annotate this by saying this is going to be a vector x dimension of size two. Uh, you can see that this two dimensional vector is then repeated four times, but the difference is that each one of these is owned by a different thread. So we can annotate that with another dimension, which is the lane x dimension of size four. And then you can see this entire four uh, times two pattern is repeated again, and we can annotate that as vector y of size two. And that's the high dimensional representation for the columns of this particular matrix. We can repeat this process for the rows as well. And what we end up with is an eight dimensional representation that consists of vector x, y, z, lane ID, x, y, z, and batch dimensions for the row and the column uh, dimensions, because in general, the tensor is gonna be larger than 16 by 16. The other things that I've, uh, I've done here, I've color-coded them so you can see which belongs to the rows and which belongs to the columns, as well as the order in which we kind of walk through this. First vector x, then lane x, and then vector y. And once we have this particular representation, the layout representation is complete. So the first natural question to ask after this is, is this layout representation sufficient? Is it expressive enough? And to answer that, we can look at the B and C matrices. And if you follow a similar right line of reasoning, you can see that we can come up with layouts for the B and C matrices of the MMA sync operation as well. And so by this, we have completely characterized the layouts of the A, B, and C, and, and D matrices, which is the same as the C for the MMA sync operation. So now that we've shown that it's expressive enough, the next question is, well, we have a layout for the MMA sync. How do we propagate it to the other operations that surround it? And once we've propagated the layouts, how do we do vector distribution with this high dimensional layout? So let's address the vector distribution part of it next. So let's start with, and I'll walk through a couple of examples of uh, these vector ops and show you how we can transform them from the SIMD representation to the SIMT representation that is key for the GPUs. So if you look at the top right here, you see this is the SIMD representation. We have the 16 by 16 matrix but we're gonna transform that into the SIMT representation where now we're only looking at the data that is held by a single thread, which is of the size four by two. So the key question here is when we do a transfer read or a transfer write, what is the row and matrix, row and column of the, mat uh, of the elements that each thread needs to own? And that can be derived from the layout using these equations. So in that sense, the layout is kind of self-contained because we can derive all the vector distribution properties just from it. Some additional key things to mention here is this IR is just showing loading one element at a time, but this approach can be extended to load multiple elements at a time, so you can use more advanced instructions such as LD matrix. Next, we move on to contractions, and this is a more one-to-one -one map. Here you can see the vector contract maps directly to the MMA sync operation. Uh, just a couple of things to note here as well is we've standardized in the form of the vector contraction and we need to keep track of which of the reductions as, as we do those. Uh, and finally, we get to reductions. Here we have the vector contract followed by a reduction, a broadcast, and a transpose. So the first thing to mention here is if we have the layout of the result of this vector contract, then we can use that layout for this quantity as well because it's, it's reduced and broadcasted to the same shape as before. So now that we know that it's a, a reduction followed by a broadcast, we can emit the appropriate butterfly shuffle instructions. But we need to know how many lanes are involved in this reduction. And for that, we turn to the layout. In this particular case, we are doing a layout reduction across the red, which are the columns. And so looking at this lane X dimension, we can see that there are four lanes involved in the reduction. And so we can use that to emit the appropriate instructions. Finally, the last part is how do we deal with 1D vectors? 
In the case of uh, flash attention, we end up with situations where we are operating on the results of the reduction. And in order to do that, we have to have a way of handling them. One option is to just consider the layout of the rows or the columns. But doing so, doing so would result in introducing a lot of conditionals into the code, which would increase the complexity of the code. So an, alter an alternative approach that we use is that we treat the 1D vectors as pseudo 2D vectors, which have been broadcasted along one of the dimensions. And this allows us to reuse the layout of the MMA operations. So now that we've gone over the rules of how do we do vector distribution, let's consider an example, which is a flash attention in this case, and a brief overview of how this works. Uh, you, know, you have a matrix multiplication operation followed by a softmax followed by another matrix multiplication. And the reason why this naive implementation doesn't work well is because you have to materialize something that is of size n by n, where n is the sequence length, which can be on the order of millions of tokens. So that's why we don't want to do that. The way flash attention handles this is using three core tenets. One of them is fuse. Let's fuse all these three operations together. Let's tile, uh, and so we do that. But let's also tile at a granularity less than one row, because one row can be of length n, which is a million, which is quite large. So when we do tiling at, uh, because we have a reduction along this particular row, when we do tiling at a granularity of less than a row, we have to do some kind of fix, some or fix up or aggregation to make sure that the answer remains correct. So we start with a LinAlgex representation of the op, which this decomposes into the matrix multiplication, the softmax. After we do vectorization, bufferization, and a bunch of other optimizations, we end up with this gigantic IR, which uh, I guess it's a little hard to read, but you see there's a vector contract here, which is the matrix multiplication on top. The second uh, vector contract at the end. In between, you have what is the fixed up softmax, which has multi reductions, uh, as you would expect in a softmax. So, can we use this and do the vector distribution? Yes, we can. But there's one step before that that we need to handle is we need to assign a layout to each one of these values here. And so that leads us to the layout propagation step. And so we can start with the vector contracts and uh, propagate the layouts of the A matrices, the B matrices, the C matrices, the same for down here. And if we propagate that all the way down, we see that there's a place where the colors don't match, which is our first layout conflict. If we do the same thing for you know, the 1D, the, the pseudo 2D values, and propagate those through, we now have a layout for all the different values in this graph but we end up with another layout conflict. And so the harsh reality of layout conflicts is in general, you will have different kinds of layout conflicts, but not all of them are equal. Any kind of layout conflicts that involve the lane IDs uh, will require a trip to shared memory. And so in general, those are the ones we want to avoid. But any kind of layout conflicts that involve the vector or the batch dimensions, they can be actually resolved by using the appropriate broadcasting and extract operations. And in this particular case, as it turns out, layout conflict one is a batch and vector conflict, and layout two is just a batch conflict, as a result of which this entire flash attention operator can be done with the data living in registers the entire time, which is a big win from performance. Using the traditional code, we can see we get our LD matrix instructions, we get our MMA sync instructions, we get our shuffle instructions, and so we're happy with uh, the ISA. To conclude, I've introduced a new high dimensional layout for vector distribution distribution that hopefully is expressive, self-contained, and generalizable. We are currently evaluating the performance of this approach. And in the future, we would like to generalize this approach to see how it could be represented instead of a high-dimensional vector representation, but as a series of composable transformations. The other thing you might have noticed is it's very it's implicit. It's not present in the IR right now. So how can we go from an implicit layout representation to an explicit IR representation? And finally, we would like to extend this to more than just NVIDIA GPUs, AMD GPUs, and several other custom accelerators. Uh, this was joint work with Thomas Rau, who's unfortunately not here, but thanks to him as well as the Not AI and EVT. Thanks. I have 30 seconds to spare, and I'm going to refresh these slides. I'm not going to stop sharing my screen because I have trust issues, and I want you all to see that I refreshed it. It's happening. Yeah. Slide show. All right. With that, XLA FP8 development. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Puyo Janity. I'm a Dale Firmworks manager at uh, NVIDIA, and uh, I would like to talk to you about the um, FP8 integration into XLA um, that my team has been working on. 
Uh, big shout out to uh, Shu, Philip, um, Nathan, Kaishi, uh, from my team, and also Reed from, from Google. All right, so what's XLA anyway? Uh, what's uh, FP8 anyway? Um, uh, of course, by FP8, I mean here uh, the NVIDIA um, uh, variants of the FP8, um, uh, of which there are two flavors, E4 M3 and E5 M2. E4 M3 refers to uh, four bits of exponent and three bits of mantissa and one bit of sine. And E5 M2 has one extra bit of exponent and one less uh, mantissa. Um, aside from the difference in the range, um, they, uh, E4 M3 also cannot represent infinity, so we have to saturate to uh, to the max value, whereas E4 uh, E5 M2 can. And the the recommendation here is that um, we should use E4 M3 for weights and activations in the uh, forward pass, and um, E5 M2 uh, for the gradients because of its uh, better range. Uh, so uh, here is a example uh, of uh, E4 M3. Let's see how we can decode that. Uh, the yellow bit is the sine bit, so it's positive. The red is the exponent, uh, which reads five, but uh, we need to uh, subtract the constant bias of seven uh, from it. Uh, and then the green is the mantissa, uh, normalized uh, mantissa. So we need to add the one uh, before the naught. And this is the final number. Uh, here's the uh, FP8 ranges for the two data types. Uh, you can see that E4M3 uh, uh, spans from uh, pretty much 10 to minus two to 10 to plus two four orders of magnitude, give or take. And a 5M2, um, 10 to minus four, two plus four, eight orders. And uh, the, the red dots uh, on the left uh, indicates the uh, the subnormals, where the mantis is zero, uh, which um, helps uh, extend that range a little bit. On the right, you see the uh, the, the range in uh, linear uh, form. And the bigger the biggest takeaway is that the, the closer you get to the max values, the coarser grain the, the precision becomes. So we need to be careful about that. All right, so how does the GPU do compute with FP8? Um, so imagine you have to, imagine a jump scenario where you have two uh, FP8 matrices um, uh, uh, being fed into your uh, stream multi processor, which in turn uh, you know, feeds them into the, the tensor core, which does a multiply and accumulates to a wider type, either FP16 or FP32. And out of the tensor core, but still inside the SM, we could do a whole bunch of other fusions and apply bias activations on and so forth, and then convert back to either FP8 or any other wider data type, and uh, write back to memory. So, it, you know, you see that we do have the option of uh, controlling both the input from memory to SM and the output out uh, back to memory to be FP8 and save on the um, the, the, the throughput and um, um, I/O bandwidth. Uh, however, um, we need to scale things because FP8 only has uh, you know so much range, uh, and in order to do so, we could just employ a simplest uh, you know fix, uh, fixed point uh, scaling uh, by taking the reduced max of the absolute value of the tensor, and which we call a max, and then uh, perhaps divided by the maximum value representable by FP8 uh, to arrive at the scaling factor. This is only one way of scaling. There are other ways, and then to the extent we divide the, the white type matrix by this uh, scaling factor, we arrive at a um, FPH representation, which is guaranteed um, to you know, be uh, 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 expressing the um, uh, highest range of the uh, original matrix. OK, so we have uh, improved the, the memory bandwidth or uh, you know, uh, IO by going FP8, but uh, we have introduced the, the overhead of computing Amax. Is there any way we could hide that latency? And the answer is yes, but with caveats. So imagine your white type result um, still in the SM, and you can, instead of using the true scaling factor that is uh, computed based on the current values of the result, you can use the scaling factor from the, say, the previous training step. Uh, and to uh, you know divide and arrive at the FP8 result. Um, and while you're doing so, you can fuse the computation of Amax uh, uh, with it and uh, compute the new Amax to be used in the next training iteration. That's what we called delayed scaling. Uh, well, obviously, that's not exact. So one way to compensate for that is by uh, maintaining not only the very last uh, scaling factor, but a set of uh, uh, scaling factors from the last n steps. And 
then we can take the max of all of those and use that to generate our scaling factor. And then, uh, you know, when the new A max comes out of our fusion um, operation, then we could roll it back into our you know ring buffer of sorts and uh, kind of do the bookkeeping in terms of scaling. All right. So, uh, how does we implement all of this in the XLA backend? Uh, well, so on the left you see a TensorFlow example. Jax is very similar. We've done both, uh, where you see the types and uh, you know loading or creating the white data types and uh, creating the scaling factors, uh, which should be initialized to one. Uh, and uh, we can you know safely let the first few training iterations to set them to the correct value, and then. Uh, uh, here we quantize them to, to FP8 by dividing by the scaling factors, and then we call our JEDIT function. Um, so on the right, um, this is the uh, uh, very basic JEDIT function. It's it's supposed to be a math model, and you see that it receives the uh, FP8 um, A and B matrices along with their uh, corresponding scaling factors, plus the scaling factor for the output. Uh, this is the a priori uh, scaling for the output. And then the first thing we do is dequantize it, and uh, converted back to the white type by casting and then multiplying in that order uh, so that we don't uh, saturate, and then call the white type um, gem operation as usual, and then quantize back into FP8. Uh, and along the way, also compute the reduced max of absolute, which is the A max for the next iteration. Uh, now, what the XLA compiler would do in the back end is allow a whole bunch of things, including the entirety of the quantization and dequantization, uh, as well as the Amax uh, um, computation, and emit a single custom call um, to a, a, a Kubeless uh, library um, where it passes not the um, data types in white type, but their FP8 uh, in FP8 form, along with the um, scaling factors, and um, output uh, the data type uh, along with the new Amax that was fused computed. All right, so uh, this is this is all good, but uh, is there any convenience, uh, uh, more convenient methods to, to use this? And the answer is yes. So we're taking a three uh, uh, kind of tiered uh, approach to the API. Uh, I just covered the low level uh, pure Python API with you and uh, where the user needs to QDQ um, uh, manually. Uh, but uh, also uh, we've uh, put in um, the log um, um, functionality to alert them if uh, there was a case where they needed, they thought they were doing parameter matching, but they failed. And also the uh, pure Python uh, method for the layers and uh, uh, where we implement a dense and transformer layer for JAX and also uh, the, the model approach. So quickly uh, for the layers, uh, uh, pretty much uh, to turn a, uh, dense layer into FP8. Uh, I'm oversimplifying a lot of things, but what you do is put QDQ uh, in there, and then uh, if you daisy chain them, for example, and change all the uh, boundaries because HLO graph doesn't have none, uh, and then uh, reshuffle the bound, uh, boundaries, you can see that the dense layer could be thought of as uh, FP8 in and FP8 out and pure, pure um, dense layer. And uh, so this is a little more details uh, where we've blown in a dense layer. Uh, so what we do is put in QDQ in front of the input and the weights, and of course on the output, uh, but only engage the QDQs um, um, for the inputs in the forward path and also for the uh, input in the backward path. And the input on the uh, backward path corresponds to the output in the forward path. And we found this to be the most stable um, scaling design um, for FP8. Um, all right, so in terms of results, uh, we have uh, uh, incorporated this into a GPT-3 encoder model and uh, 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 as well as the uh, uh, BERT model on single GPU. And um, we have developed the JAX and TensorFlow dense and transformer layers that we're planning on um, upstreaming to um, um, FLAX, um, Keras, and different models. And also we're in the process of integrating this into uh, T5X for multi-GPU as well as PaxML. Thank you very much. All right, next up, we have running Jacks on Intel GPUs via PJRT. Mama Run it plus. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm Jianghui Li. I'm from Intel uh, AI and Analytics Group. 
our team's uh, job is to enable deep learning workload on Intel hardware. Uh, so we work closely with the hardware team and try to optimize the software uh, for hardware. We build the low level software libraries like 1DNN and take that to integrate to uh, AI frameworks. So, um, so as we know that uh, building a low level software for new hardware is always hard because it takes a lot of effort to um, to um, design the hardware and also to have this software running before the hardware is ready. And But what is more important is that once we have this low level software there, but we need to take that integrated to AI frameworks and the compilers. So that is a, a chicken egg issue because um, as a new device, if we want to be used by a broad set of um, users, we want to integrate our low level software to AI popular AI frameworks like TensorFlow. And, and then, um, however, uh, before before our device is being popular, and usually AI framework cannot afford to like support our device backend. So in that case, usually what we do is that, that we fork, and that we take the entire framework and then modify everywhere. And uh, unfortunately, usually the framework was developed with certain hardware in the mind. So there's lots of modification we need to do. And that created lots of burdens on our side because that, um, you know, because the framework is evolving so fast every day, there's so many patches so that we have to tracking the regression happens. There might, might be some PRs actually uh, make the framework cannot run on our hardware. So in that, um, scenario that motivate us to seeking pluggable plug-in interface. So um, that would allow us to um, separate the concern so that we focus on developer of a low level of software library while the AI framework and the compiler is quicker evolving at the same time. So um, um, it, it, we prefer to leave uh, like a derp in our uh, new our own GitHub as a um, and uh, and the further we actually also would like to build as a separate library so that our framework can build its own library and then we as a plugin um, plug load dynamically to the same process. Um, that will ease a lot of our uh, production effort, validation, things like that. Um, so that 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 actually motivate us to build the um, to co-work with TensorFlow team to bring our Intel extension to TensorFlow, for, for TensorFlow, ITEX. Um, so we worked with TensorFlow team initially to build the uh, pluggable device mechanism. Uh, it was released in TensorFlow 2.5. Uh, since then, that pluggable device mechanism has been the major the main way for TensorFlow to for, uh, to add a new device. There were three plugins developed since then. Um, Intel has one, uh, and the Microsoft, Apple, all have that plugin for TensorFlow. So when TensorFlow moved to XLA, like uh, using XLA as a compiler backend, um, so we we were interested to to find a similar pluggable interface for us to use so that we can plug in our uh, hardware backend into XLA. And, and then uh, when we talked to Google team and we found that the Google team already worked on this PGRT, which is a great fit. So the PGRT uh, C API, uh, sorry, the, the API has a two layer as a C++ interface and the list is a C API. The C API actually will help uh, us like to build the uh, ABI compatible binary. So that is a, a very nice feature. And, and the, the API is actually at high level, it's just doing compile, uh, execute, and also do some kind of device management uh, thing. Um, so that, that API is very high level so that we can we are able to implement that in a few months. And underneath uh, the compile, that takes the, the stable HO as a IR as a 
uh, uh, representation of the computer graph. So underneath, we are compile them and execute it on our device. Um, the, the Intel extension for TensorFlow actually just really the late re, uh, the recent release like uh, one dot two uh, includes this PGRT plugin for Intel GPU. It was built on top of one API elements like uh, one DNN, one CCL, and the SQL runtime. And um, so far, it can run like automatically uh, JAX workloads. So with the that release today, you know, you uh, use our user can run JAX workload, like including um, a language models like a T5, LAN T5, BERT transformer, and a bunch of customer workloads. And we also worked um, uh, made a PR to PyTorch XRA, make a PyTorch XRA can recognize this plugin. So run, uh, we started to run example PyTorch models as well. Uh, we are continue working with TensorFlow to make sure the TensorFlow slash XLA workload can run on Intel GPU. So the use it, the, um, to use this to run JAX workload is really easy. There's no JAX code change is really required. So all the user needed to do is to build that uh, the plugin following this online document, and then to set this uh, uh, environment environment variable PGRT names in the library correctly to your to, to the library pass and then um, set the, a dependent library pass that's it and then uh, at the, once you use a, uh, run the workload um, the JAX uh, slash XLA library uh, the bridge will look for this library and load it dynamically so run it transparent uh, down below we have example showing the trace uh, using this ipex verbers so how show how this uh, how the pluggable uh, plugin library is being initialized and then uh, perform some target specific optimization and do code again and execute it uh, this gives a more detailed look at the how we implement this pgrt plugin um so the pgrt c uh, so we are mainly implementing the PGRTC API so that from API perspective, it is very high level. So just to give you IR, uh, a stable HO IR, and then expect you return a PGRT executable. And then uh, later on, the, 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 execu the, ex um, the user will execute this executable as they can give you a PGRT buffer, as an input and the output. And the PGRT buffer is associated with the PGRT event. So when the PGRT buffer is returned, user is expected to look at the event to determine this PGRT buffer is ready to use or not. That actually gives a nice like uh, uh, model this async uh, dispatch. So, uh, but it is a very high level. Um, underneath we are, supporting this compilation by uh, reusing the XLA code, but using two target specific optimization. Like we have one optimization, uh, you know, like identify a small sub graph and the calling 1DM fusion. And also we have a pass which will map that the rest uh, the operations either to library or to LVM and eventually translate to SPV. Underneath we are using uh, one, one DNN and one CL, CCL. On the runtime side, um, because the PGRT runtime concept is so high level, so that gives us a lot of run, like a flexibility in terms of how to implement it. So underneath we have our own memory management and the device management. So it is relatively easy for us to implement compared to earlier stream executor uh, interface. So the simplicity actually makes things our uh, implementation much simpler and easier. So look at forward that we are, we will continue to work with the device uh, runtime team, Google's uh, runtime team to make sure TensorFlow XA workload can run uh, on top of the plugin. And also um, 
we will track the MIR lowering pass. So to make sure that MIR lowering pass can work on Intel GPU as well. Um, we will also look at integrating using 1D and graph API, and also see whether we can extend the OpenXA profiler to run on Intel GPU. Thanks. We are so on time. It makes me really happy. All right. Next we have. I need it. No. There you are. You've just been in all of the right places, all the right times this week. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Maybe a little lower. You all can hear me and see me as well. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, I'm Manish Gupta, and I will be presenting a uh, Matmer performance uh, in OpenXLA EV. Uh, this is a uh, uh, work with uh, uh, my colleagues in EV uh, team, and uh, some of them are here and uh, present virtually. So I would like to start with uh, uh, this uh, uh, pyramid that uh, was made in my head, and uh, I was able to put it on the slides here, is that uh, you have various sources of kernels that you can get these kernels from like you can uh, get it from like if you look at this pyramid from the base to the apex uh, and if you move from base to the apex uh, when you move towards the apex you have the performance on large mat uh on the bleeding edge hardware for the common cases and you when you stay at the base you you gain extensibility fusion uh, opportunities and collaboration in the code base uh, so that's what this is showing. Uh, and then you have libraries uh, on the Apex, and the examples of those are Kublas and QDNN, uh, where you are just using kernels. And then you have uh, CUDA and uh, C++. You can develop these kernels, write these in uh, CUDA, CUDA, C++. And the examples of these are Cutlass and Qt. These are open source uh, uh, header-based libraries where you can uh, write kernels. You can. Uh, so it opens up the door for extensibility to uncommon cases or give you an opportunity uh, to, to do that and then collaboration in the code base. And then on the base, you have code generation where you the, the performance uh, catches up to uh, library and handed kernels because you need to know what uh, sequence of instruction you want to generate and then hand written kernel can educate you and all these uh, layers are important. Um, so that this slide shows like various entry points, like at the base, you have more entry points. And then you have, uh, 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 you, when you go to, to, to code generation, you can basically take a lineage.matmal, tile and distribute uh, at the thread block level, warp level, uh, vector contract, uh, and then take it through all these layers. You have all these entry points where if you have this right, you can, uh, you can do a lot more, and then you on the on the uh, layer above that, you have uh, cutlass and cute or like handwritten kernels. You you again have this entry point because these are open source code bases. You can uh, tap it at the thread block level, warp level, and you can play with it with the library based approach. They are great for the bleeding edge hardware and day zero performance, but uh, uh, you if if you find your case in there, it will run. Uh, if not, then you can make a request and hope that in the rest release cycle of the library, you will, you will, you will get get those uh, with you. Uh, at this point, I would like to make an analogy that if LLMs are like refrigeration, then getting all these use cases are like ice creams. Like you have you you people who are building these applications, like DeepMind researchers, Google Brain, and then. OpenAI and then Anthropic, they will like to try different flavors of these ice creams, mix and match. Somebody will like vanilla and somebody will like salted caramel. Somebody will like to mix them like Int8 and BF16. I think our job as compiler engineers and program languages and all of that is to provide these AI researchers a reason to wake up and think that they can make the change uh, in the language that they know and uh, bring the cost of the refrigeration down and hopefully uh, the GPUs won't melt their ice creams. Uh, I will be focusing on code gen, and then the performance numbers are here. So the gray bar is where we started. 
uh, and the blue bar is where we are. The green bars are the cutlass and cupola. So gray bar, you can just see and ignore. The three bars for each set are basically uh, mapped to the pyramid that you saw. So code gen, then cutlass, and then the libraries. So we have uh, uh, two data types, uh, uh, FP16 and FP32. And for both of these, the blue bar is now pretty close to the green bars. And these are large aligned matmuls. And then the thing that has changed from gray to green, the blue bar is we move from uh, WMMA to MMA sync uh, to tap uh, NVIDIA Ampere tensor cores. And yeah, this slide shows that simply moving from uh, WMMA to MMA sync will not get you the performance. And uh, wherever you see blue, it's basically the uh, code gen. Uh, and I'm wearing blue as well, uh, coincidentally today. So uh, this shows that you just replace WMMA with MMA sync, you will not get the performance. Uh, MMA sync is a fast math instruction. So you have to do the extra work to keep that math instruction fed. And uh, uh, to fully exploit it, you have to do like everything you do with handwritten kernels, you have to do in your code gen as well, which is uh, avoid bank conflicts, choreograph to get the best instruction scheduling and more. And that's what it shows that the gray bar to blue bar, this you have to do fine grain scheduling and coarse grain scheduling to reach and take the blue bar higher and higher. Uh, so yeah, things are not done. I mean, we can go in improving the depth and width uh, to different uh, broad categories. You can improve the performance of a large magma. Uh, we did uh, work on main loop instruction scheduling. We worked on uh, address arithmetic. We did slightly look at rounding. We can look more and then epilogue. And the next part is, as Matt was also describing in the roadmap, that uh, batch magma, small uh, MNN sizes where you don't have enough Styling in MNN, you have large K, so you need split K or stream K, unaligned cases, and trying all these crazy data types, mixed input data types, and other things. Some of this we have already started and started to push uh, functional fixes and uh, performance fixes. So this is like five operations from T5 workload, where you have two batch batmul in the beginning and three matmuls in the end, and then again blue uh, is the code gen. Uh, so we have we have been able to get the the code gen performance for batch matmul pretty close. There is still some work to be done. Like you see the fourth uh, set of bars where the blue bar is still needs some some work to to catch up to the performance. On the split case, so in this graph we uh, basically ran a very small. We ran a 128 by 128 with a large uh, K, where we varied K from 2048 to 12288. Uh, so that's what you see. Uh, like the, there are a lot of these, so just focus on one. So you have, so this 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 needs split K. So uh, you you so for cutlass, you I basically sweep through a bunch of split K and pick the best one, and Kublas picks what it picks. Uh, and this is the ED performance. If you don't run split K on this size, uh, but with some performance, uh, uh, functional and performance fixes, uh, uh, the performance of the code gen is improving. In and uh, the last blue bar is basically showing if you could uh, uh, get the split K, where what happens in a split K based kernel is you have a small M and N shape, so you cannot. Uh, tile it enough, so you have to split the K dimension and call a separate reduction kernel. So once you have all of that, then uh, the code gen uh, performance is uh, also decent in that. Uh, it's not yet done. Uh, there is an uh, we are trying to improve the API to use split K, and there are some restrictions on split K uh, that we are working on uh, removing. I think that's it. Neuron compiler and framework for excellence. Good afternoon, everybody. It's very uh, nice to be here in front of you. Uh, so today we'll, uh, we'll be talking about uh, our experiences uh, with XLA on trainee architecture, uh, the neuron. And I'm Amit, uh, it's Pushkar. 
So we'll be sharing the space here. Uh, so let's get started. OK, uh, so I want to give a top-down overview uh, to get started and kind of lay out the broad context of what we're speaking about. Um, so our goal is to take the large models, right, you know, in the order of hundreds of billions of parameters or more, and then scale them out into our trainer architecture, uh, which is thousands of nodes, and do this with good performance, right, and uh, with minimal uh, changes to the uh, model code, right? We want the model to execute as is. And uh, to do that, uh, what we need to do is we need to make sure the stack end-to-end -end has works seamlessly, right? And also, the when you're compiling your uh, code to your neuron architecture, you get the best performance, right? So for example, here, uh, we have about 3.36 petaflops of raw BF16 performance, per instance. And we want to utilize it as much as possible. So that's where we need the help of the OpenXLA framework, the stack, compiler, and the machine learning, the whole framework together to put it together to get the best performance. Uh, so maybe for the compiler push code. Okay. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm Pushka. Uh, this is what uh, the framework and the compiler stack looks like. So basically, we have the uh, compute graphs coming in, uh, then some uh, distributed training libraries. And then we have the compiler, which takes uh, that as an input, the HLOs as an input, and then ultimately compiles it down to a NEF. And uh, we have our own software ecosystem. We have a runtime of our own. We have uh, dev tools, uh, program analysis tools. Uh, that do profiling and uh, help you optimize uh, the programs uh, that we deal. So, okay. So I'll take over from here for this slide. So from the past, if you want to connect this slide to the earlier slide, right? Uh, so Pushpa mentioned that you you need to first get the compute graph, correct? That's the first fundamental thing. You need know, to get the compute graph, uh, generate that, and then the uh, the neuron compiler takes that graph, optimizes it, and the executable is what is the NEF that gets put around to the device, right? So the first goal is to, first, how does that happen, right? Uh, so there are a lot of libraries. Uh, I want to just name a few of them. Uh, the FSDP, the fully sharded uh, uh, pro uh, data parallel uh, framework. We have the Megatron Lyle style 3D parallelism, uh, the, S the SPIMD. So all of these libraries or frameworks take your model, shard it into fine grain graphs that each of the graphs can be in turn can be optimized, right? So we have good experience with FSDP and 3D parallelism. We already scaled to hundreds of billions of parameters with the Megatron style 3D. And we're actively pushing the FSDP out. Uh, PMD is our next target. So what we have seen through our experiences right, with these frameworks is that you need to have a kind of a, a philosophy uh, which permeates the whole stack so that you get the best performance. For example, some of them is like SPIMD, right? You have SPIMD kind of, uh, uh, you know, if you put that constraint on your, you know, uh, the model, the framework, the compiler, so you can get the best performance and also it gives you a very good customer experience, okay? So you come, you come in both of those ideas. Uh, and the other thing I want to bring here is uh, when you are compiling, right, or uh, your, your uh, distributed uh, cluster, so for example, TPUs have a mesh topology, right? But we don't have that on training. So you need to uh, even assimilate that topology also into your compilation step so that you get the best performance. So one thing what we identified is when we are trying to, so our first philosophy is give the best customer experience, right? So they have their own models. We want to take the model and through very little effort, that model should fit on the training, right? And scale. So 
PyTorch right now, PyTorch API has this torch distributed collectives. Okay. So those collectives were written for eager systems, right? Uh, and they don't have this notion of a XLA, XLA replica group, right? They all treat it as groups of processes, right? So when we took that API and tried to uh, put it on Trainium with XLA, we found some gaps. So to avoid those gaps, we, we actually generated our own XLA backend plugin that plugs into this API so that the user hasn't have to change his program. It will directly fit onto the Trainium architecture. And I'll explain the uh, what the difficulty we found in the in the next couple of slides. So, Peshkar, you can. Uh, so I'll also talk about the compiler and give you a high level overview. Uh, so it's a classic uh, three phase compilation process that we have. Uh, the frameworks give us the HLOs. Uh, we have the front end, the middle end, and the back end. So the front end has uh, uh, support for HLO dialect. Uh, uh, then we lower it to the MHLO dialect. And then we have our uh, dialect of our own called uh, Penguin. Uh, so it also relates uh, somehow to the middle end. But uh, things that we do in front end are you know, uh, classic uh, match and replace uh, operations, uh, some graph level scheduling optimization for reduction of uh, optimization for uh, collective communication ops and uh, memory footprint uh, uh, reduction as such. So this passes through a penguin lowering uh, phase. So the middle end of our compiler is called penguin. And uh, it is uh, written in Python. Uh, it does polyhedral model-based compilation. Uh, lots of aggressive uh, loop optimization uh, that do you know tiling. Uh, Factorization, fusion, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and then we hand it over to the backend, which is called the Walrus. So it uh, takes the output of Penguin and does uh, low-level optimizations, uh, uh, basically scheduling passes and allocation passes that uh, map all the compute to the different engines and uh, try to reduce uh, uh, data transfer between. The memory and the on memory and the chip, uh, and so on. So one way in which we differ from uh, let's say GPU is that uh, we try to keep the entire input graph intact, uh, which means that the compiler uh, spits out a large monolithic kernel. We are changing that, uh, so we have some options where it will sp uh, split the graph and uh, it will. Uh, compile them separately and uh, uh, make the process more efficient uh, without affecting the uh, without affecting the generated uh, NIF. Uh, so I'll quickly talk about the challenges uh, that we have uh, you know with large models you have to deal with large compile times. Uh, we are actively addressing those uh, so instead of you know flattening all the layers, uh, and then compiling them into a large monolithic kernel, we try to break them uh, into subgraphs and uh, still apply interprocedural optimizations to bridge the gap between what you would get from uh, compiling to a single kernel versus multiple kernels. Uh, one of the uh, user required features is uh, that we uh, see is uh, support for dynamic shapes. So we want to support it natively through a compiler and uh, push out as much performance as possible. Uh, and then the next class is related to distributed training. Uh, and we want to make uh, them as efficient as possible on our architecture. And uh, that's uh, those are the three wide uh, areas of our focus in, as of now. So yeah, I want to connect back the SPMD I, I mentioned earlier to this slide, just to kind of you know put two streams together, what's happening in the framework for the compiler optimization. So SPMD, right? When you have SPMD uh, imposed upon the framework, what it does is you have one graph, right? And you can compile once. That's it, right? So if you have this multiple graphs, like if you do the MPMD style, what we have seen in practice is with large models that you have a sudden compilation triggered on some worker, and everybody is waiting for that compilation to happen. Okay, so it's like, and and you have this. Uh, uh, 
uh, not anticipated delays in some workers trying to slow everybody down. So having a SPIMD or a shape programming, you know, the, uh, the same graph uh, which represents all the uh, computations is first of all going to cut down on the compilation time, right? The second important thing is, as Pushkar mentioned, the collective communication aware optimizations. If you have a SPIMD where you can combine both compute and communicate uniformly, right, across all the workers, the compiler can be very aggressive in optimizing both of them together. So, so that's the uh, you know the, the idea of SPIMD and how is it important for us? Uh, and just to give a get a get a like a you know more pictorially what I was trying to say. Uh, so, for example, here you have a stack with PyTorch XLA. I, the top level represents your program, right? The model, uh, and the way you lower it down, you have XLA graphs. And as Pushkar is mentioning, you have this giant graph which has forward, backward, with all the compute communication operations embedded into the graph. Right? Now that graph will be taken up by the compiler, optimized, and you run across EFA. EFA is our fabric, uh, you know, across across the nodes. So SPIMD is critical here, for example, because you once you get this XLA graph, you can hand it over to the compiler, one XLA graph, optimize it completely, you know, uh, do a very fine-grained compute communication overlap, you know, fusion, whatnot, right? And then, uh, and then as you see, right, the, the three operations that we heavily focus on, all reduce, all gather, and reduce scatters. These can be interchanged, reordered for performance. All that can happen if you guarantee that you have SPIMD. Yeah, I don't want to again emphasize SPIMD, uh, but what uh, we have seen, like I, I think I've, I mentioned you one slide where we took the PyTorch API and tried to lower it down. So what we saw was, if you do it blindly straight away, you get a lot of MPMD style semantics because PyTorch distributed API right now only has semantics re revolving around local groups. So we changed that from local to global groups so that the MPMD is not there. So we have SPMD. So that's our first thing we did. And uh, I want to just hit upon this issue of topology awareness. This is important because not all clusters are, are built the same. You have meshes, you have factories, right? So what we need is a mechanism to represent all of these hierarchies while we're comparing, compiling for the for these systems. Uh, yeah, I think pretty much, I think I'm end of the talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up we have using QDNN Runtime Fusion for Attention and XLA. All right, um, so I'll be representing my team, um, the XLA team at NVIDIA, and I'll be talking about how we have integrated QDNN Runtime Fusion for Attention and XLA. Um, well, as we oh, okay. Um, as we all know that um, LLMs is is the thing uh, in the community, and transformers are at the heart of LLMs, and obviously the multi-headed tension is at the heart of these transformers. And at the heart of these multi-headed tensions is the dot product attention, and we want to make it go faster. How do we do that? We try to fuse it. XLA has its own fuser. Uh, as you all know, but it can't fuse these kind of patterns, right? So we rely on other uh, implementations. And for us, we thought, hey, what's the best next, next the best thing to go to is QDNN, because QDNN actually supports uh, this uh, scale uh, dot product fusion, and they have shown that they can perform really well. And I mean, I've just thrown some numbers here and. Just as like a proof of concept, they have been able to get up to 4x speedups over a few softmax kernel, uh, which is through Apex on an H100. So, and they can support multiple flavors through runtime fusion, and they have been generating kernels through runtime fusion for a while now. So we are like, yes, of course, this is the right way to go, and let's try to implement Kudianen's runtime fusion uh, into the XLA stack. Uh, so I'll just go briefly over the high-level design. Uh, we there are a few flavors and, and everything is through runtime fusion, but there are I mean it's 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 a regular expression, but you can I just split it up. Uh, these are the few flavors of um, of uh, the attention module that Kurianan currently supports, and and these pretty much cover all the prevalent uh, 
modules, uh, MHA blocks in the current uh, space of LLMs. And the long-term uh, goal for Kudian and NXLA is to generate these kernels like an arbitrary uh, block, for forward prop at least, uh, which is like a BMM with a point-wise introduction with another BMM. But as of now, it's it's these few uh, uh, patterns that, that Kudian supports. And uh, when we look at the training support, uh, we look at both forward and backward. Uh, again, these are uh, these four uh, patterns, which are pretty much uh, covers the prevalent uh, LLMs at this point, and can give us performance. Uh, so this is this is what we are we are trying to support in XLA as well. And one thing to note is that Kudinin just needs one intermediate tensor, because the the dropout information is kind of uh, stored in the sign bit of the this S tensor. Um, so yeah, uh, this is this is pretty much like the high level design, and I don't want to get into the details because probably most of you know about this. Um, now let's talk about the actual GPU compiler pipeline. So we have actually it's not just a simple rewrite that we found that we we need to do uh, not, not a pattern matching rewrite because there were a few challenges. First of which we had to kind of introduce a sort of a canonicalization. Now. There were two modes of canonicalization that we had to do. One is the argument reversal. Argument reversal is a tricky one because it's it's, it's not obvious. So what happens is if in the front end someone uses an einsum, let's say for example, an einsum is let's say right contracted, the arguments get reversed, and Kudin has its own semantics where it needs the arguments in a certain way. So we kind of had to do a canonicalization, introduce transposes, etc., to make sure that the arguments are in the correct um, correct order. And also, we had to manipulate the layout of these arguments because Kudian again, it's 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 starting out, and there are some constraints that the kernels can support. So, based on those things, the layout had to be manipulated to some extent. And again, there were some transposes that had to be involved. Um, I, I, I currently don't have time since it's a lightning talk to go into the, too much of the details, but I have them in the slides, which probably we won't be able to get to. But so bottom line is we we kind of have to canonicalize the whole whole MHA block, introduce some transposes, et cetera. And then we can sort of rewrite this fused attention block to a custom call, right? Once we do that, since we have introduced these bunch of transposes, it makes sense to run the algebraic simplifier uh, uh, for once. So it can fuse these transposes and generate a single transpose. Now, as you might expect, like, wait, wait, we've introduced a bunch of transposes now, right? So you might actually eat up on the performance. So we also had to introduce a, a new fusion pass, which is basically fusing these transposes to the custom calls. Because all Kudianen at this point cares about is how you provide, you can provide the layout, technically. You can provide the strides to Kudianen, and it can actually consume all these transposes. and. Once you consume, um, again, there are some caveats and constraints to that, but you can technically consume these transposes and basically lower the whole thing, uh, a, a non-canonicalized version of, um, or a non-standard version of this MHA block into a single rewrite. Uh, once you actually have done this rewrite, you go through the regular stack. Uh, we don't need an auto-tuner right now, but this is kind of a placeholder. At this point, we don't need to auto-tune anything. Uh, then you go through the MLIR lowering stage and uh, from the uh, to MHLO, and then you can either go through a thunk emission for the runtime or the XLA runtime. The XLA runtime is still uh, in progress, uh, but we've kind of have the thunk emission going, and then you have the runner, and that calls into the stream executor. Obviously, the XLA runtime would also call into the stream executor. Uh, right. So now, actually, I pretty much sped through the whole thing. Uh, so we can talk about the performance. So we've kind of got interesting performances. So first off, what we found was this is just on an attention block speed up. And for inference, we could find up to, oh, again, can't see it, up to around 3.3x. I promise I had it in a different font and color. It just shows up this way. Uh, up to 3.3x uh, performance uh, for inference blocks. Uh, this is a T5x attention block. And on on um, yeah, and and so for um, sorry, uh, yeah. So these are the two kind of uh, flavors of of uh, of the uh, MHA block. One is just uh, uh, 
mass bias with oh, sorry the one is with F f16 and the other one is with bf16 with the masked bias and so we this is this there's a small uh, nuance to this is the masked bias which means the bias is actually the mask is actually added to the bias and it's an additive bias we don't actually add the mask explicitly and this kind of works for t5x and then for training similarly for like an attention block we found that uh, we kind of got up to like a 2x improvement on just the block itself uh, this is for f16 and from bf16 we kind of got somewhere around again close to 2x performance um, so yeah, I mean, we also did like an end-to-end -end performance, and this is all work in progress. Uh, and this is for the, one of the first times that multiple teams have come together to uh, emphasize on this this project. That we've integrated this into XLA while Kudianen is working on this. Um, so we've also kind of gotten good performance end-to-end. -end, and remember, this is not a custom implementation; this is a com compiler implementation. And we've got up to twenty-three percent implementation uh, uh, performance improvement on a single GPU. Eight GPUs with uh, data parallelism, approximately 19%, um, and around 12% for uh, two-way uh, tensor parallel and four-way data parallel. Uh, for next steps, Kudianen is developing is almost the first version is out. We are developing the the flash attention. We're trying to integrate the flash attention kernels, um, and there are and there are more optimizations that we can actually uh, introduce to our current implementation. Uh, we can have the Fuse QKV tensor implementation, uh, which is like uh, taking the QKV as a single tensor, and that's a, an additional optimization, the F FB8 optimization. Uh, we do plan to work on uh, sequence length one for inference support, but that depends on, on the market requirement at this point. Uh, and then there's an additional uh, optimization that we are trying to implement, which is a dynamic sequence length support, which QDNN um, does support. Uh, again, I don't want to get into the detail of, of dynamic sequencing, but it can actually load the, only the, the elements that it needs and not load the whole tensor. So yeah, we do expect better performance, even more performance. And uh, what we've been able to show that um, integrating QDNN's runtime engine into uh, XLA has been able to give us good performance, even compared to some custom call implementations. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I think I'm on time. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, you can just, this is a appendix, which I could have never gotten to. I appreciate uh, your speedy chat and the, sorry for hovering. It's your favorite topic, right? <laughs> so yeah, I want to talk about sparse compilation real quick today. I uh, try to make up for the last one minute. So. Uh, uh, when a tensor has a lot of zeros, we call it a sparse tensor. And they go back to like uh, the days of high performance computing, but nowadays with ML, uh, uh, they're back again and they're even higher dimensional. So, very exciting. Um, we differentiate between like general sparse, where there's like no structure at all, or structured sparse uh, uh, tensors. So, typically, unstructured means you, you don't see any structure, you need more metadata to store them. Uh, when there's a structure, uh, you need less metadata to store them, and accelerators are a lot better at those. Uh, CPUs are a lot better at the general one. One comment about structured sparse, sometimes you cannot really see the structure. Take like two out of four. When you plot it, it looks almost like this, but there's actually a structure in there that an accelerator can use, and uh, uh, you want to do that. Um, obviously, you can reduce storage requirements. You, s you store only the non-zero, so you store less in memory. That's always good. You can also reduce the computational time when you actually do the, uh, the computation. You only do the computations that are needed. You exploit mathematical properties. So you say that if I add a zero to something, it remains uh, itself. If you multiply it, uh, it becomes zero. You throw away a little bit of IEEE uh, uh, arithmetic uh, under the rock here because like not the numbers operate differently, but you want to exploit sparsity. This is what you're going for. Um, obviously, you can exploit sparsity explicitly. You can just uh, get your NumPy arrays, make indirect addressing, etc. But it's it's complex. You have to really think about it. What we're proposing is make sparsity implicit. So uh, you see it as a property and, and not so, some tedious implementation detail. And then a sparse compiler, as we call it, actually uh, converts it automatically to sparse code for you. 
This idea goes back a long time uh, when sparse tensors were still uh, nice two dimensional, but uh, uh, it has been formalized to higher dimensions and we want to bring this to the open XOA world. Why would you care? Well, explicit start with sparsity. You have to design from the start. You start thinking, okay, I'm going to store it this way. Then you actually change your code to exploit that data structure and make it run faster. But once you uh, have made a choice, it's back. It's very hard to go back and, and change that again. Um, with implicit sparsity, the code itself is completely agnostic of the sparsity. So you actually can focus on the code and not, not on sparsity details. Um, you can select a, a storage scheme with just a few annotations and then the sparse compiler does the rest. And if you find out that you made the wrong decision, you just go back, change the annotations, and with the push of a button, you get a new sparse algorithm. And you can even exhaustively exploit those all possibility, something that you could never do if you do it by hand, or even when you like, like compose libraries. We did this in MLIR. Um, you see two Linux metamols here. They look exactly the same. This one is DINs, this one is sparse. The operation remains the same. The only thing that I changed here is the type. So there's a CSC there. You think, hey, is that a compressed uh, a store? Uh, 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 yes, it is, but it's not a fixed storage. It's actually an annotation that tells you how to store it. So there in the blown out box, you see that you can actually like define many more sparse storage schemes with those annotations. You're not stuck with one, but the key point is here that the IR is exactly the same. You focus on uh, operation and not so much on the sparsity. We envision a healthy sparse ecosystem and we need a lot of components for that. So uh, we need, of course, uh, the frameworks, uh, TensorFlow with sparse tensors, JAX with sparse tensors, and after all the previous story, uh, uh, presentations, I wish I had put PyTorch there as well with sparse tensors. Um, then it maps to some IR. Well, stable H low is of course here the story, but we want to add sparsity to that. So we have an RFC for that. So click on it and say, yes, I want this because then uh, the governance body will be more motivated to start doing this. Then we want to have like a nice compiling infrastructure. Well, uh, built on MLR, but uh, uh, of course now open XLA. And the sparse compiler will be part of that. Uh, one misconception, I wish I'd called it differently. A sparse compiler is not a separate compiler. It's really a plugin into a regular compiler. So your dense computations remain just as fast as they were, but when it's sparse, we actually compile it for you. So just a caveat there. And then it maps it to your favorite backend. Example, uh, sparse JAX, which really fits the philosophy that we were building in MLR uh, well. So, you have a function foo, and you just say, oh, I do a dot product. Dense, sparse, I don't care. It looks the same. Um, you can call it dense. It actually gives the dense result. Hey, you can call it sparse, and suddenly you did a sparse uh, computation for you. We have a collab actually running uh, where you can try this out. Uh, so you can do this dot product, and then you see that you actually have computed the sparse computation there. Um, the only thing you have to do here is sparse JIT. It's a little bit like uh, JAX JIT, but it also does the sparsification in the water for you. Uh, you can plot uh, nicely the result. So matrix multiplication on the CPU, plot it against the density of the matrix. Uh, it's runtime, so lower is better. Uh, going from left to right, the matrix becomes more dense. So to the left, you see that sparse really runs fast, and then cross over the dense one at one point. It should be really like going up. It plateaus a little bit, maybe some gas effects or so. You haven't really looked into that. But the point here is that around 20% you cross over. But if you go really sparse, like here, you see what the speed up compared to the dense one. The dense one is of course flat. It doesn't care about zeros or non-zeros. We envision this hybrid execution uh, where a sparse compiler, when it sees a general sparse, Picks your favorite uh, CPU and runs on it. But if it sees some structure, then it picks your favorite GPU and maybe in the future also a TPU. We're not that far yet, but we're getting there. So, in summary, uh, we believe that a sparse compiler should generate sparse code, not a human. 
uh, it's, a, it's a implementation detail. Uh, we're looking for a healthy sparse ecosystem. We believe stable H low with sparsity is the way to go. We believe open XLA with a sparse compiler plugin is the way to go. We're looking for more and more frameworks. So sparse JAX is already there. We hope that other frameworks will start adding sparsity as well. And these are the targets we have in mind.